السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين أما بعد All praises for Allah and salat and salam are for the messenger of Allah what follows Dear Muslims in these 10 days, there is the best of it still left. That is the best of this majestic season for servitude to Allah. Its final days still remain. And that is uh, from the best 10 days in the world. And these are the days of Arafah and the day of Anahar. So what I want to do is quickly remind us some of the things that we discussed before so that you can still continue with them in these days that remain, tomorrow, tomorrow is the eighth day, then we have the ninth day and the tenth day. So during this magnificent period that remains, let us increase our mention of the unrestricted, unrestricted takbir that is not limited to a specific time and, and place, except obviously the hammamat, that is the toilet and so, but generally you can say it anywhere you can say it in your house you can say it in your kitchen you can say it in your car while you're driving to work you can say it whilst walking right and it's not restricted to time you can say it in the morning you can say it in the evening you can say it during the day before prayer after the prayers and this starts from the beginning of the month of the hijjah and it ends at the end of the day of the tashriq yeah i'm a tashriq are three right they are a uh, the 11th, the 12th, and the 13th. That's after the day of Nahar. These are all days, the day of Nahar, and these three days are days that you can sacrifice him. And these are basically Eid for the Muslims. And so on the 13th day when the sun sets, that is when this dhikr, this mutlaq dhikr, this unrestricted dhikr, which the format, the best format for it is, uh, there are three formats for it. We mentioned one here, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Wallahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Wallillahi alhamd. You can say the Allahu Akbar thrice also. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah. Wallahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, walillahi alhamd. You can say it like this also. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, three times there, la ilaha illallah. Wallahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, walillahi alhamd. So those are the three formats for the dhikr. So you should constantly say this, and you know the meaning of it. Allahu Akbar is Allah is the greatest. La ilaha illallah is there is no deity worthy of worship but Allah. And Alhamdulillah is all praise belongs to Allah. So as for the restricted zikr, that is the unrestricted one, but you can say at any time, any place, except for those places like the toilets and things like that, that uh, it is not recommended for making zikr in it. As for the restricted zikr, it is limited to the time, to the time immediately after prayer. And it starts from the Fajr of Arafah. So look, Arafah is picked out, right? So we said these are the, the, the two best days, right? So Arafah is picked out here. So it starts from the Fajr of Arafah and lasts until after the Asir prayer on the last day of the day of Tashriq. So it's Yom Al-Arafah, that's the ninth, the tenth, there's Yom Al-Nahar and the three days of Tashriq. So after every Salat, you say the Takbir, the same Takbir, Allahu Akbar, 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 Wallahi Alhamd. So you say it at these times, after every Salat, you say it. So you, you do your, uh, you, as soon as the salat is finished, you say it directly after that, inshallah. Uh, also, for the among for the dhikr that you you continue to say, and you should say all the time in these 10 days, and these are for the 10 days up to the day of Nahar, is increase in saying, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. Subhanallah means how perfect is Allah, alhamdulillah means all praises for Allah, la ilaha illallah is there is no deity worthy, worthy of worship but Allah, and Allahu Akbar is Allah is the greatest. So this is restricted to these 10 days. So I hope you understand the difference. There's an unrestricted zikr that we mentioned the format for that starts from the first day. So we can continue with that now, the 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, anytime, any place, inshallah, except for toilets, right? Then there's a restricted zikr that starts from the day of Arafah after Fajr, directly after the Salat, you do it after the Salat every time. Then we have the zikr, SubhanAllah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, at any time also. This is unrestricted and this can do any time in these 10 days, but this is something that you should do. An additional thing that you can do that is very important is make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
right? Make tawbah, right? And the Prophet used to do that every day, he says, right? And he would do it in one sitting. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayhi. Astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayhi. Right? You know, you say it like that. I seek, uh, I seek Allah's forgiveness and I repent to him. Right? And you can also seek forgiveness. Now, what this does is that when you do, when you make tawbah and you seek forgiveness, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accepts your forgiveness and he accepts your tawbah, then you have no sin. He, he wipes out the sin for you. The tawbah wipes out the sin. Okay? So uh, you want to do this, especially, especially for the day of Arafah, you want to make a lot of tawbah, a lot of istighfar, because there is no day that Allah frees more slaves or nations from the fire than the day of Arafah. So this is what you want to do for that day, inshallah. For additionally, another way to earn forgiveness is to fast the day of Arafah. Allahu Akbar. Look, I mean, by just fasting the day of Arafah, you expiate the sin of the past year and the coming year. The past year, all the sins are gone. And then Allah wipes out your sins for the coming year also. So mashallah. So, I mean, this is one good way. Without even saying astaghfirullah or without seeking the forgiveness of Allah, you can, you can get the forgiveness of Allah by just uh, fasting on that day. And I mean, you know, Arafah is the... Uh, amongst the best days in the year, right? And we don't want to get into talking more about Arafah because we want to deal with other things that have more importance for the other days because we spoke about Ar Arafah already. In addition to the above dhikr mentioned uh, on the day of Arafah that you can do for Arafah, that is Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, wa lillahi alhamd, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, astaghfirullah, atubu ilayk, right? And doing the dhikr like morning and evening dhikr and all of that, inshallah. Do all of these dhikr, Make, increase your dua, read Quran, do sadaqah, right? But the dhikr that is prescribed, the best dhikr for the day of Arva is la ilaha illallah wahdahu la sharika lah, lahu al-mulku wa lahu al-hamd, wa huwa ala kulli shayin qadir. I'm a Muslim, I mean, it is recommended from the sunnah to say it a hundred times in the day, all right? This is the best thing, and there are so many rewards to that, right? But for Arafah, this is one of the best, the best dhikr that you can, you can do, inshallah. So, alhamdulillah, you know, learn it, inshallah. Learn the dhikr. La ilaha illallah wahdahu. La sharika la. Lahu al-mulk. Wa lahu al-hamd. Wa huwa ala kulli shayin kadir. It is specific for Arafah. So, Phil, take the day off if you have to for Arafah and the day of Nahar. Right? If you have to take time off for this, this special day, take time off and fill it with good works. Take out some sadaqah and give it. Recite Quran as much as possible. Do as much zikr as possible. Make as much dua as possible. Do as many righteous deeds as you can. Go visit your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters. Try to cut, uh, tie back all your relationship with them, inshallah, and do as much good as you can. Moreover, uh, what should always be our aim, inshallah, is to check our sincerity and make sure that we are doing everything for Allah and looking for reward from him alone and from no one else. This is what we should always have in our mind. So this is something that is very essential because sincerity, Allah does not accept any action except if it, if it is done with sincerity. Allah doesn't want it. Allah wants every action that any person does that he wants him to accept that it must be done with sincerity. He wants, he is, it is very important that we understand this. So may Allah bless us with the blessings found in these days Accept our sacrifices in them and write us to be from amongst the slaves he frees on the day of Arafah. I mean, you know, we should work for this, inshallah. And if we should take a day off, inshallah, just for this, then inshallah, we should do that, inshallah. Those who want to do the udhiya, the udhiya sacrifice, should stop cutting his hair and nails until he, he or she has offered his sacrifice. It should be noted that if a person deliberately do, does any of these things, like removing a nail or the, the nails from his fingers or his toes or his hair, from his head or his private parts or underneath his arms, whatever, all right? He or she, uh, if they deliberately do that, they must seek forgiveness. But it is not required to offer an extra sacrifice, uh, inshallah, for expiation. And the udhiya would still be accepted. Whoever, however, if someone needs to remove some nail or hair because it is harming him, then such a, so, uh, like such a, as a person having a broken nail or wound in the site where there is here, they should remove it, inshallah, and there is no sin for that, inshallah. Now, so we come to, those are the reminders, inshallah, that we had concerning the previous lecture that we did, inshallah, and some additional things that we said uh, in it. Now, what we want to do, inshallah, is to deal with the udhiyah and how it came about. There is this, this story, right, is the greatest 
is the greatest manifestation of sacrifice in history. And alhamdulillah, in Surah Safat, from Ayah 100 to 105, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described this surah for us. And I'm taking this, and I just want to read the tafsir as a, of a Saadi uh, for this, inshallah. Because I think the way he put it over is nice. I mean, I would have liked to speak on it and really talk about this story separately because there is so much in this story, mashallah. And it shows this majestic slave of Allah, Ibrahim alayhi salam, his amazing uh, submission to Allah, right? Um, so, you know, let us read the story. Ibrahim made the following dua. My Lord, grant me a righteous son. And this was after he despaired of his people and did not see any good in them. You know, he, he was a person who was inviting people to Allah all the time. And nobody was listening to him. The only person that really listened to him, the only Muslim in his time that was around him was his wife, Hajar, and his, his cousin, Luke, alayhi salam. Right? So after he despaired, from his people listening to him, he begged Allah for his son. He asked Allah to grant him a righteous son through whom Allah would benefit him during his lifetime and after his death. Allah the Most High answered his prayer. So we gave him glad tidings of a forbearing son. This was undoubtedly Ismail, whom Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described as forbearing, which implies that he was patient, had a good attitude, was big hearted, and was forgiven towards anyone who caused offense. And this is something we would notice uh, you know, that he was forbearing. He was very patient. This is how Allah described, it, described him, and we will see it in this story, how patient he was. So when the son reached the age where he could help him in his endeavors, that is, help Ibrahim in his endeavors, that is, he reached the age where he was the dearest he could be to his father. At this time, I mean, you know, the, he's not a child anymore where he needs pampering and he needs help. Now he could help, right? So there is no trouble in looking after him and he could not be, and he could now be of benefit to him, that is Ibrahim, alayhi salam. So Ibrahim said to him, at this particular time, when, uh, you know, at this age, when your son become independent and he, you know, he start blossoming, inshallah, you know, this was the age, mashallah, uh, Ibrahim, uh, Ismail was in, right? So Ibrahim came to him and he said, inni ara fil manami anni athbahu. Indeed, I see in my dream that I must sacrifice you. That is, I have seen a dream that Allah is commanding me to sacrifice you. One of the things that we must notice here is that dreams of the prophets are revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when they got a dream, it means that this, it is something that they must do. This is a revelation. And so he got this command from Allah to sacrifice his son. Now, I mean, I could start talking about this and start asking people questions about like, Consider yourself, how would you be if this was your son? And I mean, if you had to do this, what do you think? What do you, I mean, what would you do about it? So Ibrahim asked his son, what do you think? For the command of Allah must be fulfilled. Ismail alayhi salam, and look at his forbearance here, showing patience, seeking reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and showing obedience to his father. He said, oh my father, ya abati. And you know, the, the word in Arabic, Allahu Akbar, the word abati, is a very nice form of addressing your father. It's not just, oh father, it's oh my beloved father. You know, the, the way he spoke to his father was with this honor and, 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 and this respect of, a, of a, a, at the highest level. So he said, oh my beloved father, do as you are commanded. If alma tu'mal, do as you are commanded. That is go ahead and do what you have been commanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do. You will find me inshallah amongst those who are patient, amongst uh, actually, it didn't say the actual word that is used. Satajiduni, uh, insha'Allah, mina sabirin, right? Sabirin here means uh, the forbearing, right? It is. This is for his wife, Sarah, uh, for his wife, Hajar. Ismail is the mother of, uh, is the son of Hajar, alayhi salam, right? So here we find Allah describing us, him as steadfast. Right? Allah described him as steadfast in the ayah above. And here we find that he said that you would find me, he's telling his father, go ahead and sacrifice, go ahead and kill me, Allah slaughter me. Allahu Akbar. Right? You will find me, inshallah, from among the steadfast. Ismail told his father, Ibrahim alayhi salam, that he has resolved to be patient. And he mentioned the will of Allah alongside that, 
next to that. He didn't say, you will find me patient, but he said, if Allah wills, because nothing happens except by the will of Allah. Even for him to be patient would be by the will of Allah. And brothers and sisters, this is something, to, to, uh, this is something important to understand, that anything of the future you said you, are going, you say you are going to do, say inshallah next to it. This is very, very crucial. This is a beautiful lesson that we learn here from Ismail alayhi salam. That is Ibrahim and his son Ismail alayhi salam, and Ibrahim resolved to kill the apple of his eye. Now, this was the most, he didn't have any other children. He had this one son, and he got this son at the age of 100. He was begging Allah for a son, and he got the, this son at the age of 100. Now, when this son grew up to, and he was such a respectable son, mashallah, right? He was so beloved, and so, so beautiful that, I mean, it is difficult for, it would be difficult for anybody to go and kill a son like that at that time. And he was waiting for a son, right? So he resolved to kill the apple of his eye, his son, in obedience to his Lord's command, Allahu Akbar. You know, and this is, and this is to tell us, this is, to, you know, to show us, as we, I'm going to explain later, inshallah, that when it comes to sacrifice for Allah at the expense of something that we love from this dunya, the sacrifice of, for Allah must take precedence, right? So, I mean, if we want to say that we really believe in Allah and really are obeying him and following his commands, right? Inshallah. So, so Ismail, Ibrahim, alayhi salam, he resolved to kill the apple of his eye, his son, in obedience to his Lord's command and for fear of his punishment. That, he was, that is, he was fearful of the punishment of Allah. And Ismail resolved to be patient so as to obey his Lord and please his father, thus regarding this ordeal as nothing. So it was really nothing to them in the end, right? Ibrahim had laid his, and Ibrahim laid his face, had laid his son face down on the ground. That is, he made him lie with his face towards the ground so that he would not have to look at his face at the moment of slaughter. You know, this was to make it easier for him. So at that time, when Ibrahim was about to slaughter his son, right? Allah called out to him. Allah said, we call out to him at that tense moment when he was, when he was about to do the deed that he was commanded to do. That is sacrifice his beloved son. He was going to do it. He was going to kill him. All right? Can you imagine that, brothers and sisters? Think about it. It's a very, very amazing situation, right? It's not an easy thing. So then Allah says, Ya Ibrahim, Ya Ibrahim, Oh, Ya Ibrahim, you have already fulfilled the dream. That is, you have done what you were instructed to do, and you resolved to do it, and took all the measures that were required, and now there is nothing left but to pass the nice knife over his throat. So that was all left. He, he readied him for a kill. He, he told him that he was going to kill him. He readied him for the kill, and all he had to do was pass the knife. And then Allah says, Thus do you are those who do good in worshiping us, giving precedence to, our, to seeking our pleasure over their own whims and desires. So you have to always check this out in your life as a Muslim. Me and you, this is something that we always have to do. We have to check ourselves. Are we allowing our whims and fancies and desires to overtake us when it comes, when it is at the expense of pleasing Allah? Like for example, I have to go to the masjid, I have to go and pray, I have to pray my five salat, Am I allowing my whims and my fancies? I'm looking at a nice TV program, so I'm going to sit on and not go to the masjid instead or not praying in jama'ah or, or, you know, whatever the case might be, right? Or for the sister who's not wearing her hijab properly or who goes out of the house, with, uh, goes out of the house without fully being covered. I mean, look at this sacrifice of Ibrahim alayhi salam and look what Allah says, does do we reward those who do good in worshiping us, giving precedence to seeking our pleasure over their own whims and, and desires. That is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is only testing us to see how we're going to, to, to operate. After that, he's going to make the way open for us for this. Uh, for this with which we tested Ibrahim was clearly the most difficult of tests. That is true which the purity of Ibrahim, uh, true which the purity of Ibrahim, his love for his Lord and the fact that he was indeed the close friend of Allah were made manifest and became clear. Now, if we want to, to have any kind of honor with Allah, then this is the kind of level we have to get at when it comes to our life. Allah always has to be in front, always has to be number one. So when Allah bestowed Ismail upon, uh, Ismail upon Ibrahim, alayhim salam, he loved him dearly. That is, Ibrahim loved Ismail, but he was also the close friend of Allah, the most gracious. He was Khalil rahman right? And we know that about Ibrahim, alayhi salam. And close friendship, is the highest level of love. Close friendship is the highest level of love. It is a level of love in which there is no room to love anything else. That is along with it, 
or next to it, right? It is the highest level. There might be other love. I might love my son. I might love my daughter. I might love my wife. But the love for Allah has to be highest. And we see it manifest in this. And this is definitely the case in Islam. Allah has to be our, our biggest and, and, and most important love. He has to be what we love first above everything else, right? A level which dictates that one's, one be attached to one's beloved with all of one's heart, right? So it means that anything else that comes in place that I love, that I have a connection to and I love, I feel the... The uh, I feel love for that that thing or that person. Then, if I have to sacrifice between Allah and that person, I would sacrifice the person for Allah. You understand? So, what he is saying here, what the Sheikh is saying, as part of Ibrahim's heart became attached. Ibrahim's heart became attached to his son Ismail. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wanted to make his entire heart attached to him and to test how sincere and strong the bond of close friendship was. So he commanded him to slaughter the son who was most beloved. Uh, whose love has, com who has, has competed with the love for his Lord. That is what the Sheikh is saying here, right? So Allah is testing to see which, to let Ibrahim manifest. But when Ibrahim gave precedent to love of Allah over his own desires and resolved to slaughter his son, all attachments to competitors were removed from his heart, whereupon there was no longer any benefit in slaughtering him. Hence Allah says, for this was clearly the most difficult of tests, for sure it was, right? And we ransomed him with a tremendous sacrifice. So uh, when we by our sacrifice, we go out to get it, inshallah, we should have this in mind, you know, um, we are trying to emulate Ibrahim alayhi salam in, in his sacrifice, right, what he was going to sacrifice, no, we have to try to bring the story to mind, inshallah, and what we should try to do also, if we can afford it, inshallah, brothers and sisters, don't, 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 don't play around, go for it, if we have to do an entire cow, that is good, an entire camel, that is good, and, and uh, you know, well, you can't do, a sheep cannot be sheared, right? A cow can be sheared, and many people shear, okay? But sacrifice for Allah, many times when people go to sacrifice, they don't, they, 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 they slaughter anything. This is not how it should be. You know, Allah says, with a great ram, you placed it with a great ram, which Ibrahim, which Ibrahim slaughtered. It was great in terms of it being the ransom for Ismail, and in terms of it, be, it being one of the sublime acts of worship, that is sacrifice. And in terms of it being a means of drawing closer to Allah and a precedent to be followed until the day of resurrection. Now, so we start dealing, inshallah, we start, uh, we're going to start dealing with the here sacrifice, inshallah, because this is what is important to pay attention to. The word would here, means an animal of the an'am class, that is camel, cow, sheep, or goat. So we can slaughter from any, any of those, right? Any of these. That is slaughtered during the days of Eid al-Adha. During the days of Eid al-Adha. So it can be slaughtered on the 10th, the 11th, the 12th, and the 13th, up to sunrise, up to sunset, right? Because, and it is done because of the Eid, and it is done as an act of worship. So all of this is important. So you're not just doing the sacrifice because you're sacrificing. It's an act of worship with the intention of drawing closer to Allah truth. So when you're sacrificing, brothers and sisters, check your heart. Let us check our heart. Why are we doing this act of sacrifice? Because of the, we are trying to fulfill a command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Um, we want to fulfill this. Even for those scholars who say this must have, there are some scholars who say it's wajib to do. If you have the ability to do it, you don't have any choice in it. Right? Like the Hanafis. But they are, the majority of them say it's must have, it's recommended. But still you see like, I mean, when you check the evidences, they all look as if it is wajib, inshallah. So, you know, so you think of it as a worship, but it's an act of worship. It, even if it is must have, if it is something that is recommended, it's a highly recommended sunnah, it is still something that is, that is dear to Allah and it's something that we should want to do to get our intention should be to draw closer to Allah. It's evidence. The, this ritual of Islam is prescribed in the, in the Quran, the sunnah, and it's the consensus of the Muslim. Allah says, therefore, turn in prayer to your Lord. This is in Surah Kawsar, right? Therefore, turn in prayer to your Lord and sacrifice to him only, all right? And Allah says, uh, interpretation of the meaning, say, O Muhammad, قُلْ إِنَّ الصَّلَاةِ وَنُسُكِ وَمَحْيَاءِ وَمَاتِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ Okay? Say, O Muhammad, verily my salah and my nusuk, my sacrifice. So the nusuk here is, the meaning of it is sacrifice, right? Uh, my living and my dying are for Allah, the Lord of the worlds. So this is how we should be. We should always try to make every aspect of our life for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to check everything we go to do. 
Why are we doing it? Is it something that Allah likes? Is it something Islamic? Inshallah, and then we do it. The word Nusuk means sacrifice. This is the view of Sayyid ibn Jubayr. It is also said that it means all acts of worship, including sacrifice. So here, Nusuk, uh, some of them says it means sacrifice, and some says, indeed, all my acts of worship, right? But uh, the most accepted meaning for Nusuk is the sacrifice. In the Sunnah, Anas ibn Malik said the Prophet وسلم, sacrificed two white rams speckled with black. He slaughtered them with his own hands, said Allahu Akbar, and, his, and put his foot on their necks. So this is something that we should, this is something from the Sunnah, this is what the Prophet ﷺ did. So we should want to slaughter the animal ourselves if we have the ability to, okay? And we should do the takbir and do what he did, inshallah. The Prophet ﷺ, uh, stayed in Medina for 10 years, offering sacrifice every year on Eid. Okay, so the Prophet offered sacrifice as did his companions, radiallahu anhum, and he, he said that sacrifice is the way of the Muslims. Now, the consensus, all of the scholars of Islam, all of them, there is no dispute among them that they unanimously agree that it is prescribed in Islam. That is, the sacrifice on the day of Eid is pres prescribed uh, in Islam, as was narrated by more than one of, one of, 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 one of the scholars. It's ruling. The majority of scholars hold that it is sunnah mu'akkada, that is stress sunnah. This is the view of a Shafi'i, Malik, and the most well-known view of a Ahmad. Abu Hanifa, on the other hand, holds that it's obligatory for the one who can afford it. This is also the view of Ahmad in one of his, uh, one of his views. Ahmad has two views on this. One of it is that it's wajib, right? But the most predominant well-known view of Ahmad is that it is sunnah. And it, this, the, 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 the issue that it is wajib is favored by Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. Sheikh, Sheikh uh, Muhammad ibn Usaymin rahimahullah said, Udhiyah is sunnah mu'akkada for the one who is able to do it. So a person should offer the sacrifice on behalf of himself and members of his household. Because this is what the Prophet ﷺ did, right? He sacrificed for himself and the members of his household. Of his household. Uh, Udhiyah is one of the great rituals of Islam in which we remember the unity of Allah, that is Allah's oneness, his blessings upon us. And, and alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed us with money and we are willing, we are willing to sacrifice, we are willing to spend, we are willing to spend out of that money that he has blessed us with. He gave it to us, mashallah. And he is telling us that this, and this is a part of his deen. He made it a part of his deen, you know, just to test us if we are going to be willing to sacrifice for him, right? So don't be skimpish in, when you go when, to, to sacrifice uh, for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Uh, uh, so Udhiya is one of the great rituals, rituals of Islam in which we remember the, the oneness of Allah, his blessings upon us, and in obedience to uh, what Ibrahim, uh, and in, in, in recognition of Ibrahim's obedience, right? Our father, Ibrahim, his obedience to his Lord. And in this act of uh, Udhiya, there is much goodness and blessings. So the Muslim must pay attention to his great importance, inshallah. The following is a brief look at this important ritual. The basic principle it is that it is required at the appointed time for one who is alive on behalf of himself and the members of his household. And he may include in the reward for it whoever he wishes, living or dead. So when you're sacrificing this, slot, this animal, you can sacrifice it on behalf of your household, of your family, your wife and your children. Every person doesn't have it to do a sacrifice. And you can include anything, anyone else in that, inshallah, your father, your mother, inshallah, even if they're dead, right? But to do a sacrifice with regard to Udhiya on behalf of one who is dead, if deceased, deceased bequeathed upon up to one third of his wealth for that purpose or included it in his wealth, then these wish, wishes must be carried out. If the person bequeathed it, if this is a part of his, what he, what he bequeathed as a part of, 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 of his wealth, what he left, uh, you know, inshallah, as an endowment, then this, it must be done. On the other hand, if a person wishes to offer sacrifice on, on behalf of someone who has died, the sunnah is for him to include the dead in his udhiya, in his udhiya. And when he slaughters it, he should say, Allah, uh, Allahumma hadha anni wa an ali bayti. Oh Allah, this is on behalf of myself and the members of my household, right? So when you do it, you say that. Uh, and you can also say, Allahumma minka laka, uh, Allahumma minka wa laka, Allahumma taqabbal minni. Allah, this is, uh, from me and uh, uh, minka, Allahumma minka wa laka. This is from, uh, from you and it is for you. Allahumma taqabbal minni. Oh Allah, accept from me. 
So he does not have to make a separate sacrifice on behalf of every deceased person, okay? The scholars agreed that sacrificing the animal and giving its meat in charity is better than giving its value in charity. So they are encouraging sacrifice more than giving, you know, because some people do not, um, some people prefer to give the money. They say we're going to give sadaqa, you know? Uh, Allah prefers, Allah, the, 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 the sacrifice of the animal is preferred and giving its meat in charity is better than giving its value in charity. God, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, used to make the sacrifice and he did not do anything but that which is best and most befitting. So that is, this is the proof, right? This is the opinion of Abu Hanifa, Shafi, and Ahmad. Right? That, that the prophet, this is what the Prophet وسلم, did. He could have given the money, but instead he gave, he did the sacrifice and he gave the meat in, 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 in uh, he shared the meat to the poor, inshallah. A sheep is good enough as a sacrifice for one man and the members of his household and his children because of the hadith of Abu Ayyub. And at the time of the Prophet وسلم, a man would sacrifice a sheep on behalf of himself and the members of his household, and they would eat from it and give some to others. Now, so the kinds of animal prescribed for sacrifice are camels, cattle, sheep, and goats. Some of the scholars said that the best sacrifice is camels, then cattle, then sheep, then a shear in a she camel or a cow. Because the Prophet said concerning Friday prayers, whoever goes to the Friday prayer early, it is equivalent to him sacrificing a camel. So this shows that the, biggest, the best sacrifice based on this hadith is a camel. And this is the opinion of the three imams, that if you sacrifice a camel, this is better than sacrificing a sheep. But some, uh, uh, and on this basis, on this basis also, a sheep is better than one seventh of a camel or a cow. Okay, Malik, on the other hand, said that it is best to sacrifice a young sheep, then a cow, then a camel, because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam sacrificed two ram, and he never did anything but that which is which was the best. So this is the opinion of Malik Ibn Anas radiallahu anhu, radiallahu anhu, that uh, it is better to sacrifice a sheep instead of a cow or a camel. Okay or to share between the cow and the camel and divide it into seven, seven parts. The response to this opinion, however, Sheikh bin Baz responded to this, uh, is that he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, always choose what is more appropriate out of kindness towards, um, towards his ummah. You know, because to sacrifice a camel for everybody or a cow, and this is something very, is a nice consideration, mashallah, you know, but the Prophet Sallallahu did what is most, more, most appropriate, okay? out of kindness for his ummah, so that it would be easy for everybody to share in this and participate in it. To sacrifice a camel or a cow would be more difficult, all right? Um, but when the Prophet Sallallahu went to his final hajj, he did a hundred camels, right? Uh, um, because because the, his ummah would follow his example and he did not want to make things difficult for them. So for this reason, uh, Sheikh bin Baz would prefer that, um, that the, 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 the easier thing be done. A camel or a cow is enough for seven people because of the report of, uh, by Jabir, may Allah be pleased with him, who said we sacrifice at al Hudaybiyah with the Prophet وسلم, a camel for seven and a cow for seven. According to another version, so a cow will be sacrificed on behalf of seven men and we would share it. The sacrifice must be done after the Eid prayer. Messenger of Allah said, whoever slaughtered the sacrifice before the prayer, let them slaughter another one in its place. And whosoever did not slaughter a sacrifice, let him do it in the name of Allah. That is after the Eid Salah. Right? So look at how serious it is. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, if he slaughters before, and this is one of the problems in sending our money to slaughter in countries like outside of our country. For example, if a person sent his money to slaughter in Saudi Arabia, so there will be seven hours ahead of where they are. In, in India and Pakistan are nine hours ahead of where they are. And the slaughter is done on the first day. They are nine hours ahead. They, they go to the Salat, like, let us say in the 10th hour or the 11th hour. Then they go to, to the Salat at seven o'clock or six o'clock, whatever the time is, right? Um, their sacrifice might be, might be slaughtered already. They don't know, you understand? So this is something that is very, very serious. When we give, send our money to be sacrificed in other places, because the sacrifice has to be done. If it is done on my behalf, it has to be done uh, after I pray my salat, right? And at least that's how I understand it, and Allah knows best. 
Uh, and this is what Sheikh Uthaymin says, as we're going to see. The strongest encouragement, the strong encouragement is sacrifice. Prophet Sallallahu said, whoever can afford to offer a sacrifice but does not do so, let him not appro approach or pray, uh, let him not appro uh, let him not approach our place of prayer. In conclusion, Sheikh Ibn Asaymin, may Allah preserve him, said, following his discussion of those who said it is obligatory and who, those who say it is sunnah, he said, each point of view has its evidence, but to be on the safe side, the one who is able to offer a sacrifice should not neglect to do so because of what is involved in this act of reverence towards Allah, remembering him, and making sure that one has nothing to be blamed for on the day of judgment, right? Uh, conditions of udhiya. So I hope that all of that is clear, inshallah. Um, seem to have some comments here. Okay. Okay, I'll slow down, inshallah, but... I have a lot of pages to go. I have 14 more pages and it's only like about 30 minutes left. So that's why I was rushing. Uh, please forgive me for that. Okay, the age of the earth here. The animal should have reached the age, uh, the required age. The animal that has to be slaughtered should reach the required age, which is six months for the lamb, six months, one year for a goat, two years for a cow, and five years for a camel, okay? So it's six months for a lamb, one year for a goat, two years for a cow, and five years for a camel. Okay, inshallah, you understand that, right? This is something that is important. Okay, and uh, many people don't know about this. And sometimes they slaughter, they slaughter animals that do not fit the, the requirement. They slaughter them younger than they should be. What defects disqualifies the animal? But here is an act of worship to Allah, and Allah is good, and I accept only that which is good. Whoever, whoever honors the rights of Allah, this, is, this has to do with the piety of the heart. Thus, the animal should be free of any faults, because the messenger of Allah وسلم, said, there are four that will not qualify as a sacrifice. A one-eyed animal whose defect is obvious, a sick animal, whose sickness is obvious, a lame animal whose limb, whose limp is obvious, and an emaciated animal that has no marrow in its bones, All right? Um, <clears throat> now, again, if you give your animal to, to, be sacrificed, to be sacrificed outside, you don't know exactly uh, how it is going to be, okay? So, inshallah, I mean, let us be careful. I mean, we must make sure that those who we give to do the sacrifice, that they are doing it properly. Defects that does not disqualify. There are minor defects that do not disqualify an animal, but it is makru to sacrifice such animals, such as an animal with a, with a horn or an, or an ear that is missing, or an animal with slits in its ears, etc. So what we should do in relation to the animal, we should really make sure that we do an animal that is wholesome and beautiful, right? Can one sell the animal? It is forbidden to sell it. If an animal has been selected for sacrifice, it is not permissible to sell it or give it away, except in exchange for one that is better. If an animal gives birth, its offering, its offspring should be sacrificed along with it. Understand that? If an animal gives birth, its offspring should be sacrificed along with it. It's on, also permissible to ride it if necessary, as is reported by Al-Bukhari and Muslim from Abu Hurairah, who said that the Messenger of Allah saw a man leading his camel and told him, ride it. He said, it is for sacrifice. He said, ride it a second or third time. So it is allowed to, to ride the animal, right? If it is need. This was while we're going to Hajj. So the person was taking his animal to Hajj and he was walking the animal. So the Prophet some told him to ride it, right? So because of the, the, the fact that it was going to be sacrificed, he didn't want to ride it. So the Prophet emphasized that he should ride it. The animal should be sacrificed at a specific, at a specific time, which is from after the prayer and khutbah of the Eid, and not from when the time for the prayer and the khutbah starts. It is not the time when the khutbah starts or the prayer starts. The khutbah must be finished. It's after the prayer and the khutbah, because many people, they pray the salat and then they leave and they go to the slaughterhouse and slaughter. And if the slaughterhouse, sometimes the slaughterhouse is right there and they might slaughter before 
the, the, the khutbah ends, right? So the Prophet says, whoever slaughters before the prayer, let him repeat it. And it extends on, and the, the slaughtering extends until before sunset on the last day of Tashriq, which is the 13th day of the Hijjah. Ali, may Allah be pleased with him, uh, radiallahu anhu said, the day of Nahar are the days of Adha and the three days following, that they are called the Ayyam Tashriq, the days of Tashriq, right? These are the, those are the 11th, the 12th, and the 13th, until sunset. That's up to when you have the sacrifice. What should be done with the sacrifice? It is mustahab that it is liked and preferable for the one who sacrificed to not eat anything on that day before he eats from it, if it is possible. Because of the hadith, let every man eat from his sacrifice. This eating should be after the Eid prayer and khutbah. This is the opinion of the scholars, including Ali and the rest. The evidence for this is from the hadith of the, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu that he would not go out on the day of Fitr until he had eaten. So that's for the Eid al-Fitr. And he would not eat on the day of Adha until he had slaughtered his sacrifice, right? And it is uh, based on what I re remembered from his, his final Eid, he ate from the sacrifice. The, he, the time he ate was after he sacrificed. It is must, uh, he, and he ate from the sacrifice, from his sacrifice. It is must have to divide the meat into three, one third to be eaten, one third to be given as gifts, and one third, one third to be given in charity. This was the ob opinion of Ibn Mas'ud, and Ibn Umar, no, the, the, the sacrifice had to be has to be ordered offered on the by the head of the household. But if uh, the sons and the mothers and so they are working and they want to do sacrifice, that is allowed, inshallah. Does every army member have to offer a separate but here like an adult son living under the same roof as well? He doesn't have to because the sacrifice will be included, but if he has the ability, he should, inshallah, because an act of worship, inshallah. How can a woman on her menses who isn't fasting or praying utilize a reward of 10 days? As doing dhikr, he is very little. Uh, she can uh, she can't fast. Um, she can listen to the Quran. Can a woman do the slaughter? I don't know of anything uh, or a woman slaughtering. Um, but Allah knows best. I don't know if that is allowed for the woman to slaughter. I've never. I mean, that's the first time I've heard that question. Really, I didn't cross my mind. Uh, for the, the sister who. Uh, she can do other things. She can do a lot of sadaqah, inshallah. She can make a lot of dua, do a lot of zikr, and do this zikr all the time. Allahu Akbar, 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 Allahu Akbar. And uh, for those who feel that when they are sick or they are afflicted, like they're on a journey and they can't do what they would, what they, what they are normally used to do. I mean, there's a hadith that says that the person who is sick or on a journey then as long as they were used to do certain things before, they would get the same reward as if they were healthy and not on a journey. So you don't have to worry, alhamdulillah. You know, you just do and you put your trust in Allah and you're going to, uh, you're going to get the reward. Who should slaughter? It is better for a person to slaughter the sacrifice himself. But if he does not, it is must have for him to be present when it is slaughtered. So all of this would be missed. All of these good things would be missed if, if someone does a slaughtering outside of the country. The scholars agreed that it is not permissible to sell anything from its meat, fat, or skin. As the Prophet said, whoever sells a skin of his udhiya, there is no udhiya for him. And it is not counted, that it is not counted as an udhiya. Okay? Uh, can the butcher be given anything from the udhiya? The butcher should not be given anything of it by way of reward or payment. Because Ali radiallahu anhu said, the Messenger of Allah commanded me to take care of the sacrifice and to give, and, and to give its meat, skin, and raiment in charity and not to give anything to his butcher as a compensation. So that this would be the best. He continued, we will give him something from what we have and not from the slaughtering, right? So um, it was said that it's permissible, uh, Sheikh bin Baz is saying this, but the hadith is very clear. So what I would advise everybody to do is not to, is to not give the butcher anything. They can pay him something, they could give him a sadaqa or something like that, you know? It is said that it is permissible to give the butcher something as a gift, and that is permissible to give some, to give some of it 
to a kafir if he's poor or a relative or a neighbor or in order to open his heart to Islam. So, uh, you know, even for the kafir, well, that I know it is permissible for a neighbor, kafir neighbor. I mean, you know, you want them to feel the generosity of Islam and niceness of Islam, inshallah. So you can do that. Where should the sacred, the, the udhiyah be done? The sunnah with regard to the udhiyah, to the udhiyah is for a Muslim to offer the udhiyah in his own country because that serves many interests and enables one to do acts of worship that will be missed out if the Muslim offered the udhiyah elsewhere than in his own country via charities to whom he gives money to slaughter the udhiyah in another country. Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen, rahimahullah, he said some people send their money and he's of the opinion that it should be done in the same place and it should not be sent out. Some people send their money for the udhiyah to be slaughtered in other places and this is wrong because the udhiyah is a ritual that should be performed in one's own land. As, as this is the purpose of the Udhiya. So we say, do not offer the Udhiya outside your house. Offer the Udhiya in your country. Perform this ritual. Offering the Udhiya by sending your money elsewhere is contrary to the Sunnah and causes you to miss out on many ben benefits, of which we may note the following. First, it can cause one of the symbols, the Udhiya ritual ordained by Allah to disappear in your own land. Now, if everybody in a particular land, like in the West, majority of people are sending their money outside. So he's saying that it can cause this ritual, this beautiful act of worship to disappear from your own land. You know, because people are lazy. They don't want to go out and make sacrifice. I remember when I was living in America, I went up all the way upstate New York and we slaughtered that day. And we didn't find sheep or anything. Me and one of my friend, right? We went to start for the sheep and we went all the way upstate and we killed that sheep just before Sunset, just before sunset that day. But that is what it is. It is, it is, a, it is a sacrifice. You have, to, you have to go out and do it. It causes one to miss out on drawing closer to Allah. May he be exalted by slaughtering it. Because what is prescribed in the case of the Udhiya is for the individual to slaughter it with his own hand. If he is not able to do that, then the scholar said that he should be present at the slaughter. However, in this case, if he sends money abroad, he misses out on doing that. It causes one to miss out on mentioning the name of Allah over it. Because if the Udhiyah is done in your presence in your country, then you will be the one who mentions the name of Allah over it. Allah refers to this benefit in his statement. And for every nation, we have appointed religious ceremonies that they may mention the name of Allah over the beasts of cattle that he has given them for food. If you send your Udhiyah far away, you do not know whether the name of Allah will be mentioned over it or not. And you are depriving yourself of being able to mention the name of Allah over to yourself. It causes you to miss out on eating from it because it is done elsewhere. How can you eat from it? Allah, may he be glorified and exalted, said, then, then eat thereof and feed there with the poor who have a hard time. A very hard time. Um, fifthly, you will miss out on distributing the meat as, as, as is required. What is required? In the case of Udhiya, is to eat some of it, get, give some of it as, as gifts, and give some of it as charity. But this will be missed. If it, if it is distributed in another country, you do not know whether it will be given in charity to the poor, or as gifts to the rich, or as gifts to people who are not Muslims. Sixthly, you are depriving people in your own country of benefiting from these Udhiya. And you will be deprived of some of giving some of the Udhiya as gifts to your neighbors and friends as a charity to the poor in your own country. Seventhly, you do not you do not know whether it, is, it will be slaughtered in the best manner or in some other manner. It may be slaughtered before the prayer or it may delayed, be delayed after the days of Tashri. And perhaps the slaughter man will not mention the name of Allah over it. All of this may happen. But if it is with you, you can slaughter it as you want in the best manner. Therefore, we advise you not to send the money for the Udhiya to be offered elsewhere. More, moreover, we also advise anyone who has surplus wealth to give it in charity to his needy brethren in any Muslim country and let him do his udhiya without extravagance or falling short. Now, this is something uh, I want to talk about, right? If, if anyone has surplus wealth, give it in charity to his needy brethren, send it to other, the other countries, let them sacrifice, that's fine. This is what Sheikh, Sheikh Fauzan says, hear what he says. All Muslims, the udhiya is a confirmed sunnah for the one who is able to afford it. People should slaughter the udhiya in their houses, eat from it in their homes, give some of it as gift to their neighbors and give some of it to the poor around them. With regards to what some people have introduced of sending the cost of the Udhiyah to charitable organizations so that it may be slaughtered in another country far away from the home of, of the person who wants to offer the Udhiyah, this is contrary to the Sunnah and is changing 
the act of worship. I'm afraid that it may be an innovation. And Prophet Hassan says, whoever introduces anything in this matter of ours, this is not a part of it, it will be rejected. Now, this is a very strong position he's taking. He is actually saying that he's afraid it can become an, an act of innovation. And this is really something that we must be worried about. Okay, so this is something really serious. So he says, whoever wants to give charity to the needy, whoever wants to give charity to the needy, the door of charity is wide open. But acts of worship should not be changed from the prescribed manner in the name of charity, right? This is an act of, he's saying this is an act of worship and it should be treated like that and it should be done in the way it was supposed to be done. If one wants to give charity, slaughter 10 cows and 10 sheep and 14 of this and 15 of that in any other country, mashallah, you have money spent. Inshallah, it would be worth it. You are giving, you are feeding the poor in the other countries, which is good, inshallah. But the sacrifice, do it there so you can benefit from all of those. Virtues of Eid. When the Prophet ﷺ came to Medina, he found that they had two days on which they would pray. He said, Allah has given you two days better than these. The day of Fitr and the day of Adha. Let me see. We have some um, questions here. No, for the deceased person, the, the cow can be divided into seven shears, right? But a person can do a whole cow if he wants, right? Uh, is separate sacrifice allowed for a deceased person? No, for the deceased person, you shouldn't, except if the person has a wak for, a wak for that, an endowment. When the person died, he decreed, he, he, from the third of money that he wants to give, he decreed that it should be uh, spent like that, right? But other than that, the, for the deceased person, it should not be done. The deceased person is included under the sacrifice of the household from, from which he is, he is he is from. Can many shares the cost? Can many share? No. Only one is allowed for the sheep. Sharing is only allowed for a cattle or a camp. A sheep and a goat are of small stature. So sharing is part. No, not because of that. We do it because this is what the, is recommended from the Sunnah. I'm leaving for the. Asalaamu Alaikum, Sheikh. Um, please take off your microphone. The ones who are vegetarians, why they can eat still? What's the big deal? They can eat from the meat. A vegetarian, it doesn't make it haram for you to, to eat meat. Islam does not, it, it only becomes haram if, it, if Islam makes it haram, right? I mean, you're, you're being a vegetarian, you, you prefer to eat vegetable. Does not make, if you make the meat haram, if a vegetarian says it's haram for them to eat meat, they are making halal, they are making haram what Allah made halal, and that is, that can lead to shuk. That can, that can take a person out of the deen of Islam. If they just say, well, I'm a vegetarian, I prefer to eat vegetables instead of meat, that is fine. But to say they can't eat it, that is trouble. Okay, and Allah knows best. Uh, alaikum, Sheikh. Can you please take off your mic? We'll talk later, inshallah. I have to finish up this, inshallah. And there are still a few uh, things I want to do. Um, if you have parent, family abroad, like, like your parents, uh, let's spend on behalf of them. Let them do a sacrifice in the country where they are. Let them, let them do, pay for their odhiya and let them do the odhiya over there. Right? Let them do the odhiya if they can't afford it. Send the money to them. Let them do the odhiya. Inshallah, and they, you get the blessings. Even if you want, if you don't want to do odhiya, you can send the sacrifice for them just you can you can do a sacrifice and have them each year it won't be odhia you do your odhia by yourself in the place where you are and send a, a, a gift to them inshallah and let them do a sheep or whatever or a cow or whatever and you let them share it there um the virtues of eid okay so we have th that for that allah has given this ummah two days for leisure two days for remembering allah and thanking him and asking him for forgiveness i want you to notice this we have two days for Eid, two days of celebration, right? And our celebration is in prayer and sacrifice and dhikr and, 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 and asking Allah's forgiveness, Allah Akbar. You know, I mean, when the Kafir has days of celebration, they go out and they, 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 they go to, to, and they use alcohol and all types of different things. Um, the two Eids only come once a year. And they are Eid al-Fitr, the breaking of Ramadan fast. This comes upon the completion of the month of Ramadan, which is the third pillar of Islam. When Muslims have finished fasting the month that is enjoined upon them, Allah has prescribed that they should follow the completion of their fast with a festival on which they gather to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, remember him and glorify him for his guidance. 
On that Eid, it's prescribed for them to pray and give charity. The second Eid is Eid al-Adha, the feed of sacrifice, which is the 10th day of the month of Dhul Hijjah. This is the greater and better of the two feasts, which comes after the completion of the Hajj. For when the Muslims complete their Hajj, they are forgiven. Hajj is completed on the day of Arafah. MashaAllah, look, nine days of beauty, the best days, nine best days, right? And then it is completed according to the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu these are the last, this, these two days, the day of Arafat and the day of Nahar are the best days, mashallah. But there's a specific hadith that the Prophet says that the day of Nahar is the best of days, okay? So it completes with the best of days or one of the best of the two days, mashallah. You know, this is honor beyond, beyond our comprehension, right? And it is highly recommended to fast on the day of Arafat, right? So the day of Arafat is a day of ransom from the fire when Allah ransoms from hellfire those who stood at Arafat and Muslims who do not stand at Arafat. Everybody is ransomed if you are included. Make dua that Allah forgive you on this day because he forgives many sins. Hence, the day that follows it is a festival for all Muslims in all religions, those who attend Hajj and those who did not. That is, that is prescribed for all of them to draw closer to Allah by means of the ritual of shedding the sacrificial blood. The virtues of this day may be summed up as follows. It is the best day before Allah. The greatest day, the greatest day before Allah is the day of sacrifice. It is the greatest day of Hajj, right? Prophet Sallallahu stood before the Jamara on the day of sacrifice during the Hajj and said, this is the greatest day of Hajj. This is because this day, for those who go to Hajj, they know the sacrifice of this day. And it is really, really, really a day of sacrifice. You have to walk from Mina and you have to come all uh, from Muzdalifah, come all the way to Mina, to the beginning of Mina. Uh, Muzdalifah is just at the end of Mina. And it extends for a long portion. You have to walk all the way to Mina to stone the Jamar al Aqaba because the Jamar al Aqaba is at the beginning of Mina, just outside of Makkah. Then you have to offer the sacrifice. You shave the head and cut the hair. This is for those who are in, um, in, in Hajj. They do Tawaf. And they do sai, all walking, walking, walking. It is tremendous sacrifice. And it is, to me, for the, the, for the hujaj, this day is really the day of sacrifice. We sacrifice everything. You know, I mean, I, I saw people walking during the hajj and their foot, their foot got corn. You know, I don't know what you call it other than that. But, you know, it, it is paining and they're still walking. It is paining and they're still walking. <laughs> it is day. It is, it is the Eid day of the Muslims. The Prophet says the day of Arafah, the day of sacrifice, and the day of Tashrik are our festivals, us Muslims, and they are days of eating and drinking. That is except for those who are in, uh, outside of, of, of Hajj. This is in Hajj. In Hajj, you can't pass on the day of Arafah, right? Um, but those who are in Hajj, outside of Hajj can fast and should fast, inshallah. Regulations governing the Eid prayer. The Sunnah that the Muslims should absorb on the day of Eid are as follows. They should do Ghusl, inshallah. I'm not going to um, go through this in detail, right? But they should do ghusl. They should eat after the Eid, after the, uh, the prayer of Eid al-Adha and the khutbah, okay? They should eat from the sac sacrificial meal. Takbir on the day of Eid. This is one of the greatest sunnah of the day of Eid because Allah wants us to do this, that you may magnify, you may magnify Allah. That is say takbir, right? For having guided you so that you may be grateful to him. Uh, the Ibn Abi Shayba with his Sahih Isnad said that as Zuhri said, the people used to recite takbir on the Eid when they, when they came out of their houses until they came to the prayer place and until the Imam came out. When the Imam came out, then they felt silent. So they would recite the takbir. So you should do this. Takbir, 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 brothers and sisters. In the case of Eid al Hadha, the takbir begins on the first day of, Eid, of, of the Hijjah and lasts until the, the, the sunset of the last day of Tashri. Description of a takbir, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And I give you the, the, uh, the, the, the sigat, the different ways in which it can be done. Wallahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, walillahi alham. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, walillahi alham. It is also narrated with different sigat, but uh, inshallah. This one is also, um, anyways, time is not uh, allowing us to do much. There's a minute more, inshallah. Offering congratulations, inshallah. This is something that we should do and the best form of congratulations. Some scholars say you can say anything. Like many people say Eid Mubarak, but there's, this is not narrated from the companions. Many people say, Kullu am, say Kullu am antu bikhair. That's not narrated, right? What is narrated is what the companions used to say is Taqabbal Allahu minna wa May Allah accept 
good deeds from us and from you. And this is what is um, important for us. And adorning oneself for the, uh, on the occasion of Eid. It was narrated that the Prophet Sallallahu had a special cloak which he would wear on the two Eids on Fridays. Okay. Uh, Omar radiallahu used to wear the best of his clothes for it. So this is what you should do. And men should, um, should use perfume, inshallah, when they go out. Uh, it's, it's haram for a woman who wants to go out to put perfume, to put on perfume or to expose men to temptation because they are only going out for the purpose of worship. So the women, as uh, you know, if they are going out, they should not use any form of makeup, any lipstick, any of these things, except they are covered with full abaya. They should not use any perfume. All of these things have sent anyhow. So inshallah, I mean, this is something that they should be careful with, right? Going to prayer, going to the prayer from one route and coming by the other route. You go, one, you walk on one way and then you come back on the other. And there, they say there are many wisdom for this, but inshallah, these are the overall guidelines, inshallah, for, the, uh, for this. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us and guide us. And I hope this was, Okay, um, so we ask Allah to help us and guide us and bless us with our efforts. And we hope that this uh, presentation is valuable and that you benefited. Um, in relation to the, to the one who says, no, the one who does not eat meat. Uh, you have to still ask why they don't eat meat because some people do not eat meat because of many reasons. And the, the reasons that they might not eat meat might not be valid because many times, I mean, you know, if it was not good, Allah would have made it haram. So I used to be a vegetarian, so uh, he born live in another country and his mother, his sister is in a different country and he wants to sacrifice with his mother, sister and food on this also. I don't, that's a question. You can ask your imam in your community for that in relation to whether you can do the sacrifice or that. But do a sacrifice for yourself and you would include them, they would be included. Do a sacrifice, and they would be included in your sacrifice. You don't have to go to, you know, you don't have to send the money there. You just do the sacrifice, and you sacrifice on behalf of yourself, on behalf of them, and inshallah, you know, that is best, inshallah. You do it for them. What is the best amount to pay for a family of two? Family of two? The husband sacrifice on, on behalf of everybody, inshallah. Um, somebody is giving some direction to the person who's asking about the woman's sacrifice. They have an answer there, so you can go to that link and see what you get there, inshallah. Uh, I have been hearing people saying that the each should be celebrated based on when the moon is sighted in Saudi. Is there a hadith for that view? That's a whole big story, different story, but alhamdulillah, I think everybody is doing the Eid together this time. That, that issue is... Uh, it doesn't have to do with sighting in Saudi, it has to do with sighting of the moon, right? And um, Alhamdulillah, I think everybody is doing that. So inshallah, let us hope that, I mean, Muslims can. Okay, inshallah. So it, just, it seems that we are okay there, inshallah. But jazakallah khair for your time and your being with us, inshallah. And may Allah bless all of you. And uh, inshallah, I'll share the document. Um, so, because there is a lot of important information in it, inshallah. But Jazakum Allah Khairan, Allah bless us and guide us and strengthen us. And, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the best in this world and hereafter. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to use the rest of these days that are with us the 8th, uh, the, the, the 9th, and the 10th, the 11th, the 12th, and the 13th, to use them in the most effective way, to get the most blessings out of it to do the takbir as much as possible, to do subhanAllah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allah, Allah, make a lot of dua, especially the day of Arafat. The Prophet son says the best dua is the, um, the dua of the day of Arafat. And the best thing that you can say is la ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika lahum, wa lahu alhamd, wa huwa ala kulli shayin kareem. So may Allah bless us and guide us and strengthen us and help us to uh, come out of this these days forgiven from our sins. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala write us from amongst those who are freed from the fire of hell. On the day of Arafah, Jazakumullah Khairan, us and our parents who have died or who are alive, and our children and our wives and their children and our uh, believe the believers who have preceded us. 
and who have died upon Iman and the Muslims and the Muslim believing men and the believing women. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all and grant us his jannah. Ameen. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik shalom la ilaha ila anta astaghfiru wa atubu alaik. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you.